it's more than just another radio show. It's a beacon of truth. Fasten your seatbelt and find out why they call Deacon Harold Burke Sivers the dynamic deacon. Join Deacon Harold for a fast-paced hour that sheds encouraging light on today's culture. Welcome to Beacon of Truth with your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. Hello and welcome to Beacon of Truth. I am Deacon Harold Burke Sivers and you're listening on the EW10 Global Catholic Radio Network. And uh, uh, we're this week, again, loving this time of year. We have so many great uh, feasts. And this month of June, of course, is the month of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And so uh, we, uh, we celebrate the Sacred Heart of Jesus. You know, for our culture, this month is uh, so-called, quote-unquote, Pride Month. Uh, but for us, as people of faith, this is the month we celebrate the sacred heart of Jesus, his loving and merciful heart, uh, which was pierced by the sword, and that blood that ran out, that blood that covers us, that blood that saves us, that blood that gives us life. And that's what we're focusing on in our faith uh, in this culture today. And today we're going to be talking with my good friend, Sonia Corbett about uh, a wonderful book she wrote called Just Rest, Inner Sabbath and Healing. You know, uh, Sonia and I have been friends for a long time. We wrote a book together called Ignite, Read the Bible Like Never Before. We've also went on a speaking tour in Australia where we uh, spent a week together on tour going to different places around um, the uh, Sydney, and uh, and then she also went to Melbourne, uh, talking about uh, about this book, and, uh, and this is a very timely topic, especially we're talking we're focusing on the Sacred Heart of Jesus, um, because Jesus' heart wants us to find rest, wants us to find peace, and we're living in a world of darkness, but yet in the midst of this darkness of confusion, uh, this darkness of of uh, hatred and triumphalism where uh, Christian voices are being suppressed, tr Christian voices are being silenced for simply speaking the truth of the faith and love. This culture wants to silence us. It wants to drag us into the darkness, but we have a penetrating light of God's incredible, merciful love flowing from his most sacred heart. And that's what we need to focus on. Um, you know, uh, the darkness is, is in the world, um, uh, and Jesus is the light that penetrates the darkness. And we, we learn in scriptures that the darkness does not overcome the light. In fact, what is darkness? Darkness is actually doesn't exist, right? Darkness is simply the absence of light. That's how you have darkness is the absence of light. You know, when you, when you don't have love, what do you have? Fear. So fear is the absence of love. You know, so these, these are deprivations. You know, and and so Sonia's going to talk to us about how we can find God, uh, how we can uh, move closer that, to overcome fear, to overcome uh, anxiety in order to find the peace that God wants us to have. So if you want to be part of the program today, just send us an email, beacon at EWTN.com. You know, this... Uh, uh, every day, I so much look forward to doing this show because we have some great people uh, working behind the scenes to make this show happen each and every weekday. We have Matt Gabinski, who's there screening your calls. We have Charles Berry doing social media. And uh, my good friend and producer, Ace McKay. Ace, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good. I'm, I'm excited to talk about rest because I feel like I'm at that stage of my life where I enjoy it more than anything. So it's like, you know, how do we find it <laughs> physically, spiritually, emotionally? Like it's, and, and I think that's the thing. A lot of people think that, you know, when you, you know, come to the church or, you know, you have a relationship with God, it's just a place of, you know, condemnation and, you know, and ridicule or whatever, but it, it's supposed to be about peace. It's only in turmoil when we're going against God's will. Yes, Exactly. And we have to make sure that we're doing actively doing things in our lives to facilitate that peace, to prepare our hearts, our minds, and our souls to receive that peace 
from Christ. And so what we so for me, part of that means is is a letting letting that light shine in the darkness and keeping myself away from things where the darkness um uh it's like a black hole, right? You shine a light to a black hole, it gets absorbed. Yeah. You know, um but uh uh so for example, not watching television for me is a way to bring peace. You know, um now, like for example, I'll watch a movie like on the plane or on um, Netflix or something like that. That that's fine, but I'm talking about um, television where it's just mindless. Uh, and sometimes we need that, just kind of a break as a getaway. But when you immerse yourself in that constantly, where it just becomes something over and over again, becomes ubiquitous. It could becomes habitual, especially if you're watching um, politics and political. Uh, television and all that kind of stuff—it just f- gets so angry yeah. and just fills you with so much emotion, and th- and that's what your focus becomes. It becomes on it, it, your focus is on all these things that are wrong with our country, with the wrong with the government, with the wrong with all these uh, sociological constructs going on in our culture, which seems to be dominating our landscape, and it pulls us away and turns us away from the light that is Christ, that is constantly coming in and penetrating that darkness. And 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 in that light, remember, we're like flashlights. Yeah, You know, God is the one that is the source of the light, but in a sense, we're flashlights helping to bring that light into the world. Because Jesus even says, remember, don't put your light under a bushel basket. Put your light up on a hill so that all the people may see the work that you're doing and give glory to God. Well, and I love the analogy, you know, for those of us that are big concert goers, right? You know, and, you know, gone are the days of lighters. Everybody just pulls out their cell phone and, you know, just turns the light on. Even if one light in an entirely pitch black arena is on, your eyes and your focus is going to gravitate no matter how tiny or powerful that light is. But then if everyone turns their light on without any of the house lights on and i've seen this so i'm speaking from experience you can literally illuminate the point of every inch of that arena with just a simple light from every person if there's 10,000 people in there it completely gets absorbed with nothing but light because everyone is shining what they can and should and that's how our faith works that's how the church grows that's how we continue to impact the community yeah, exactly right. I, I, I agree 100%. And we can't be afraid to be that light. See, I think sometimes, you know, like like kids, you know, kids sometimes are afraid of the dark. Yeah. You know, because you can't see, because, um, you know, uh, you don't feel safe in the dark. And uh, so many of us feel like that. When we look at the darkness of our culture today. We look at all the, the, the crazy radical ideas, um, things that we thought we've never seen. Um, are now, you know, things like human trafficking and the transgender is a movement and the redefinition of marriage and so-called redefinition of marriage and gender and uh, 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 critical race theory, all these social constructs and just almost a revisioning of society based on the darkness of self selfishness, Yeah, um, where I am the center, I am the light. But we, we know that the, the image of the Blessed Virgin Mary standing on the moon uh, is a reminder that we are not the light, but we reflect the light. Because remember, right. back, in a, uh, the, the, back in the day, the Jews thought that the, the sun, I mean, sorry, that the moon was its own light. They talked about the two sources of light, uh, the, the sun to rule in the day and the moon to rule at night. But, um, and so we have the Blessed Mother standing on the moon as a reminder that we are not the light. But we are called to reflect that light of Christ. So just like with the cell phone, right? The, the, that's a, a quote unquote a source of light. But the source of all light ultimately is God Himself. And and again, as we celebrate the Sacred Heart of Jesus, we see that light flowing from the heart of Jesus Himself. Well, and and again, to go back to your point of don't be afraid to shine that light, because I will tell you, speaking again from experience. Just ask God what your relationship with him is supposed to look like. Because, again, it's not going to look like mine. It's not going to look like deacons or anyone else. And that's where we get into that comparative shopping 
of, well, I, you know, I, I can't be as great of a, you know, Catholic as, you know, Deacon Harold, so I'm just not going to try. No, your look and your thumbprint, your light is supposed to be its own unique thumbprint. And so how you talk to God, how you receive God, it's going to feel differently. It's going to look the same at times to other people. But at the end of the day, one-on-one, no one's going to question your walk with God as long as you are the one that's having a relationship with him. Just sit down and ask him, Lord, what does our, our relationship need to look like? And he'll show you. Yeah, exactly right. And when we combine our light with the light of other believers, the light of those around us, uh, then that light is even more powerful and shines more brightly into the darkness of our culture. Amen. Awesome. Looking forward to talk with Sonia Corbett about just rest, inner Sabbath, and healing. You want to be with us today? Send us an email, beacon at ew10.com. Yeah, feels like feels like I should be going surfing, right? <laughs> if we can't grow the fro back, we can at least get you on the surfboard. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, bo- both both of those days are long gone, my friend. <laughs> I have people. I'll call Bear Wozniak. We'll make it happen. Oh yeah, Bear, <laughs> good guy. Uh, you're listening to Beacon of Truth. I'm your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. You're listening on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio network and uh so excited to be today be talking to my good friend sonia corbett about just rest inner sabbath and healing great topic today you want to be part of the show send us an email beacon at ew10.com and the show is brought to you by some amazing people working behind the scenes as usual charles beery doing social media matt gabinski screen calls and our producer extraordinaire ace mckay of course you know that you can take beacon anywhere you like of course on demand makes it super simple just go to ewtn and download our mobile app you can get that in your app store google play wherever you are streaming and know with over 50 new podcasts every week including tv programs it's available 24 7 when you go to ewtn.com simply click on demand All right. Well, when you hear that music, that means it's time to break open God's word in the Psalms. Of course, we're using the revised Grail Psalms, which have been approved by the church to use in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And it was prepared by the Benedictine monks of Conception Abbey. And today we're looking at Psalm 50. So grab your Bibles, open up to Psalm 50. Uh, So Psalm 50 is in book two of the Psalms. And Psalms 50 was written by Asaph. So Psalms um, 42 to 49 were written by the sons of Korah. And then we have that one Psalm written by Asaph, and then 51 to 72 by David. And then 73 to 83 is also Asaph in in book two. So this um, Psalm 50 kind of uh, kind of sits in between the sons of Korah and David. And this is quite a long psalm, so we're not going to be able to uh, exegete the whole thing today, but we're going to just take a look at the first six verses. So Psalm 50, the, the prescript is very simple, a psalm of Asaph, right? And uh, Asaph um, uh, in, in Hebrew means to um, uh, faithful, right? Uh uh, to gather, sorry, to gather. So Asaph means to gather. And so it starts, The God of gods, the Lord, has spoken and summoned the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting out of Zion, the perfection of beauty. God is shining forth. All right. So it starts off with a call of God, God reaching out to his people, reaching out to his creation. Um and out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God is shining forth. So God is the sun. And this reminds me again of um, in the New Testament, uh, Zechariah, right? When he, that beautiful Benedictus prayer, where he says, The dawn from on high 
shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. Of course, that light being our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so here, Asaph refers to God as like the rising sun. And out of Zion, remember the heavenly Jerusalem, God's light is shining forth. And in verse 3, our God comes. He does not keep silence. Right? Again, again, for me, foreshadowing the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He does. He comes. He does not keep silence. He, he's hearing the, the prayers of his people crying out for salvation. And God fulfills his promise to his people to establish that new and eternal covenant by sending forth his son. Before him, fire devours, around him tempest rages. He calls on the heavens above and on the earth to judge his people. Now, how can heavens and earth judge people, <laughs> right? So back in uh, in Jewish culture, for example, um, it's when, when a, typically when a covenant is being established, it's like, like, you know, this rock will be a witness, you know, to, to the plans that are being made here today. So in other words, uh, it says that even though we may forget the 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 plants, the trees, the the rocks, the things around here uh, that are going to be enduring from generation to generation, they will bear witness to the promise even when the people forget. All right, so that's a a typical uh, Jewish technique using to remember uh, that the things of nature. You remember God's promises when God's people themselves forget. And then verse five, gather my people gather my holy ones to me who make covenant with me by sacrifice the heavens proclaim his justice for he god is the judge so god now is reaching out to his people as that sun that's shining forth in our lives and he's gathering us together um, and the heavens are going to proclaim his justice for god himself is the judge right and so uh, God's justice cries out to us. Uh, so we don't have to worry when we see injustice happening in the world because ultimately God is the judge. God's the one who's going to make sure that his love and his truth shines forth in the midst of everything going on in our lives. You know, I've got friends who have tattoos and one of them has one that says, only God can judge me. And I, when he got it, I was like, um, you should really be frightened by that thought. And, you know, having that on is not like a banner of you can get away with whatever. I mean, God will judge you. So <laughs> I hope you understand the weight of what you just put on your body. Yeah, I see. Exactly right. Exactly right. Excellent. Well, uh, I'm so excited today to bring uh, to you my good friend, Sonia Corbett. Uh, she is a prolific author and uh, outstanding speaker, uh, and we wrote a book together, Ignite, Read the Bible Like Never Before, and we also toured Australia together, um, uh, doing tours, talking about that book, how people can engage God's Word in a more uh, meaningful and, and deep way. And so today, I'm having her on, and she's going to talk about just rest inner sabbath and healing so without further ado sonia welcome to beacon of truth it's so great to have you here hey there deacon it is wonderful to be with you again i've missed you <laughs> yeah i miss you too <laughs> i miss you too it's so great to have you so um for a lot of listeners this is probably the first time that they're hearing you or maybe even, or unless they live under a rock, you know, they, they, they haven't heard of you. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about your um, your story so people can get to know you before we dive into our topic. All right. Well, it really, uh, that's a great segue into the subject of the book because it came about, Just Rest came about after a couple of church splits that I experienced as a non-Catholic. I grew up Baptist down here in the South. I'm sure everybody can tell I'm from the South. And we experienced a couple of church splits and I understood those as being the continuation of what God had been forming me in personally, because I have a father wound and it made me angry. It made me rebellious. And so what I had been learning personally 
about submission to proper authority and dealing with the the pain underneath my anger, I started seeing it playing out publicly in these in this little church that we attended as Baptists and that church split twice and when it the second time it split it was the same situation in a different way it was a different pastor but it was the same sort of rebellion in the people and it was really it was based on a, a personality difference is really all it was but I saw it happen twice and it devastated the church and so it seemed to me to be a an exclamation point or a a literal illustration of what happens publicly in a church collectively when a predominant fault of rebellion is allowed to sort of um, go unchecked. And at that point, because I had learned that twice makes a pattern, I learned that in my own life and now I could see it publicly, I started really digging into you know, what was the Reformation then? <laughs> and I started reading Martin Luther, and, and what I discovered is that Martin Luther had a father wound as I had, and it caused him to do the very same things. And so we withdrew from that church, and I, I started delving into the Reformation. I had a friend who invited me to Mass, and I went to her Mass, and I felt sorry for her the whole time. But it, there were things about it that kept sort of pulling me in. So there was a type of perfect storm that led me into the Catholic Church. And at that point, God kept telling me through my daily reading in the scriptures that he wanted me to rest. And I said, well, I'm not tired. <laughs> I don't need to rest. But what I started to finally come to realize as I submitted <laughs> to, to his word in my life is that I was not at rest at all because it's not a matter of a lack of activity it is rest in our thoughts and our emotions, our bodies and our souls. And so that journey from Protestantism into the Catholic Church was the background for this book. Ah, wonderful. So when just just to, to clarify, when you mean church split, I think that means something different for us as Catholics, because for us, if a parish gets too big, then it splits, meaning they build another church and <laughs> and like where a neighborhood grows and, and it can't fit all the, the people in the church there. So they build another church to accommodate the, the burgeoning community. But that is something different okay. than what you mean by church split. Yes. So for a Protestant, when a church splits, it splits out of an, a disagreement or an argument or a problem where part of the church believes one thing and has one side and another part believes something else and has another point of view and they just won't work it out and can't coexist so half of those people go off down the road and they start their own church and they take half the resources half of the people half the finances everything and so it is truly a severance it's a divorce in effect and that was actually one of the attractive things about the Catholic Church is even though those disagreements occur, you can't destroy a pastor and his reputation and, and a family and their livelihood based on a disagreement in a personality or a temperament or any other issue. So, yeah, it does mean two different things. I'm glad you clarified that. A church split in a non-Catholic church or a Protestant church, it, at least as uh, the way I experienced it, was this complete divorce that devastates the entire community. It's miserable. It's almost like a reformation within a reformation, if you will. Exactly. Only it's no reformation, it's a destruction. Destruction, wow. Well, we're talking with uh, my good friend, Sonia Corbett, very prolific author and speaker and uh, also gives uh, advice as well. It has study courses on the scriptures. So excited to be talking to her today. You want to be with us? Beacon at EWTN.com. Yeah. 
just reminds that me laid back kind of groove. Yeah, I like that. This reminds me a little yeah. bit of the, the spooky, scary, spooky, scary. I think it was a Disney or Warner Brothers cartoon when I was a kid, and it like used to always freak me out because it was just like creepy animation with music. That's what, that's what I think of when I hear that. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of just that laid back groove, and you know, and just. Uh, you want to hear something funky, but you don't want to dance? This is the kind of stuff that's you listen it. to. That's a chill in the corner that. kind of song. <laughs> yeah, that's it. We're li- listening to Beacon of Truth. I'm your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and you're listening on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. So excited today to be talking to my good friend, prolific author and speaker, uh, Sonia Corbett. We're talking about... Uh, a book she just wrote it and a great topic called just rest inner sabbath and healing and uh, we'll be talking with sonia and just in a, in a minute here uh, if you want to be part of the program just send us an email beacon at ewtn.com and uh, that music that you heard and you hear in all these segments are brought to you by the number one producer in my heart ace mckay Thank you, my friend. Of course, uh, Word on Fire is a great chance on Sunday afternoon for us to have some chill time and get with Bishop Robert Barron as he illustrates the truth and beauty of Catholicism. If you want to join him, of course, that's right here on EWTN Radio, and you can stream it as well on demand. All right. Well, again, so excited to be having uh, Sonia Corbett on today. You know, Sonia is someone, if you don't know who she is, you definitely need to get to know her. I mean, I recommend her all the time when people, ask, especially if they're looking for female speakers, you know, because they're, they're re- truth be told, there's really not a lot of full time women speaking enough in the Catholic Church. And uh, if you want someone who will just uh, blow you away, knock your socks off, this is Sonia Corbett. Uh, she's the author of a number of books. Uh, we even wrote a book together called Ignite read the bible like never before and we also did a tour of australia uh, where we talked about the the book and how people can break open god's word to get to know him better and to uh to enrich and and and, and enhance their lives uh boy she's uh uh uh, she's the host of evangelista bible study on catholic tv uh she has uh many different bible studies uh, she's a, a columnist at the Great Adventure Bible Study blog, contributed Magnificat. Uh, she was raised as Southern Baptist, as she just said, and um, and now she's Catholic and going around preaching, teaching, writing. Um, she even does uh, like life coaching, and she has a, a, a great, I mean, fearless is just fantastic, unleashed, exalted, just a great, great book. So. Uh, Sonia, thank you so much. It's so great to have you on Beacon of Truth. Oh, my. It's totally my privilege. Thank you for having me. All right. So um, you you said a little bit about Just Rest and and sharing your story uh, with us uh, uh, in the last segment. But now we want to dive into this uh, Just Rest. So um, we talked a little bit about how the the book kind of came about but what is this about and and uh, the people who are listening right now i'm sure are intrigued by this topic because we're all looking for peace we're all looking for consolation um we uh we did a previous show we talked about silence embracing silence and even jesus says come away for a while by yourselves that kind of that you talk about inner sabbath and healing um the inner sabbath for the heart the soul mind and strength and this um what you call a gentle tsunami of healing occurring in the church right now through the triumph of the immaculate heart so just break break this topic open for us all right well i because i was brought up baptist i had a daily habit of being in the scriptures and that's really that was the the main movement for me into the catholic church i came in in 2006 and during that time of extreme upheaval i just kept getting out of hebrews chapters three and four that's the context of the book and it is a summary of the exodus of god's people away from egypt their slavery in egypt through the desert 
and into the promised land of rest because the promised land for them in Hebrews 3 and 4, it talks about that promised land as being a Sabbath. And so the, the word Sabbath means rest. So that's part of why it's called inner Sabbath because what I discovered is during that time of such upheaval because it was a crazy time and I, I go into all that was going on in the book. But, you know, it was difficult on my marriage. It was I left behind my ministry and and expected that that would be permanent so that was a grieving kind of time i was very angry at the people at the church in this this little church that i was in that i kept getting in trouble for being rebellious <laughs> but they seemed to not get in trouble at all and i knew from denominational leadership that it was rampant everywhere it wasn't just our little church it was everywhere and so that showed me that it was a fundamental problem and as I started just looking at the word Protestant, you know, I thought, okay, well, clearly we're just a bunch of protesters. And that's, that's how I felt. That's how, that's who, really who I was, to be perfectly honest, throughout, you know, my younger, probably 20s and 30s even. But I didn't want to do that anymore. And I, I could see that it was not good for the church either. And so God kept leading me to this idea of rest. And, and because I had left that church, I wasn't serving anywhere so I was physically resting, but struggling against it after about a month because I, I wanted to be using my gifts and talents. And I knew I had a duty and responsibility to do that, but I wasn't able to because we were attending a mega church. It was like 14,000 families. It was enormous. So there wasn't anywhere for me to serve. And I felt like I had been benched. And so as I struggled against that, the Lord used Hebrews 3 and 4 and then the, the whole story of the Exodus to show me and to say to me that our fear and unbelief in the deserts that we find ourselves in, our fear and unbelief is unrest. And that's what he's really after. He wants us to be resting. He wants us at peace in our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our bodies. He our thoughts and our emotions and our memories. And when we're in a desert situation, there are natural and repeated deprivations. We don't have what we need. It might be literal where for them it was food and water and leadership and entertainment and those kinds of things. For us, it might be a lack of love. It might be a lack of support. Whatever it is, our deserts have deprivations built into them. And he says to us in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, that they have not known my ways and they shall not enter my rest. So they, they weren't able, that first generation was not able to enter the promised land of rest because they didn't know his ways. And in the context of that story and going back to the original story in Exodus and Numbers, we see that there are several ways and God expects us to know them. One of them is the way of the desert. We don't grow unless we're challenged in our deprivations because the deprivations draw up all of that unrest and fear in our emotions and our thoughts and our bodies. And so that's strategic. It's meant to do that so that we will go to God and ask him for what we need rather than murmuring and complaining the way the children of Israel did in the wilderness. And what I saw there was another way. So the way of the desert is one way. The way of repetition, because over and over and over again, God allowed deprivations in a common theme. The first was the food and then the water and then just over and over. And the strategy was to move them to a place of deeper trust. But over and over, they got hung up in the negativity of their fear and their unbelief, which led to sin, which leads to unrest, which led to a forfeit of the promised land. And so the scriptures say over and over there, it, it's, it's mentioned in the book of Hebrews, but Paul also summarizes it in Corinthians. It's summarized in the Psalms, Psalm 95, Psalm 78, over and over and over again throughout both testaments. This story is set before us as a template for the Christian life. And so we're going to be in the desert. There's going to be repetition in those lessons. And if we can hear him in those and not submit to the fear and the unbelief and step out in risk and trust and just ask him for what we need, he will provide it and it will be a blessing. 
So our thoughts then are the first thing we have to really wrestle with because the negativity and the complaining for the people of the wilderness in the wilderness is part of what contributed to the repetition in their experiences. So the first thing they encountered was a lack of water. And it says in Exodus 15, 23, that they came to the waters of Mara, but they couldn't drink them because they were bitter. And it sounds like the water was bitter, so they couldn't drink it. But the rabbis commentating have commented on that passage and said, it's not that the water was bitter. It was that the people were bitter. And because they were bitter, they couldn't receive the blessing of the water. The same thing happened in the next chapter in Exodus 16 with the manna. They needed food. They complain and whine and poor Moses, you know, he doesn't know what to do with them. And God rains down manna on them. But not long after, in the book of wisdom, we even see that it, it's tailored to the, the taste and the need of the people, each of the people. But later on, they call it worthless. They're just tired of it, which, you know, I've been I've been po in my life and we've eaten a lot of hamburger. And over time, you just get sick of it. So it's not that God doesn't understand those things. It's that he wants us to ask him for relief in those areas. And he wants us to trust him and wait until he provides because he always will. So the first thing we have to encounter is the negativity and the fear in our thoughts and also in our emotions, because when we are deprived of, of something we need, particularly in a relationship, in a love relationship, when we're not being supported or not being loved the way we, we feel like we should be or that we need to be, we start to experience this repetition of not just fear, but there's anxiety under it because there are memories attached to those experiences and those emotions. And over time, they become a habit. And so in a deprivation, the first thing we have to worry about, thinking about, is trust. We have to trust God to provide, and he will. But then we need to also look at those emotions because they're dark. You know, we're angry, we're afraid. And so God wants us to he wants us to confront those things and the memories that are attached to those. So the first way is the way of the desert. The second way is the way of repetition. And the third way of the, of the Lord is the way of the word we see in Hebrews 3 and 4. So it's his word that walks us every day through the deprivations and through the desert so that he can calm that anxiety and that fear and that unbelief and, and, teach us to trust him even if we don't see anything changing on the outside he teaches us through his word to trust him on a daily basis so he tells us over and over again through the new testament not to worry and he says in philippians 4:19 my god will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory that's a promise he tells us elsewhere, Paul says, take every thought captive. So we can control our thoughts, and we know that biologically now. We know the neuroscience behind the process of thought, and we know that if we control our thinking away from fear, that the emotion won't be added. And if the emotion is not added, then we don't get sucked into this negativity and rumination and fear that things aren't going to go well or that we're not going to have what we need. So as I was trying to learn how to rest and I kept saying, I'm not tired. What God kept showing me was you're not at rest at all. You're still very angry. You're afraid now because now what do, do we leave behind everything we knew of our faith in the Baptist church? And that's exactly how it began to feel. And I had no idea where we were going. All I could, I just remember asking him, Lord, you cannot possibly be asking me to be Catholic. You can't. <laughs> and yet the more I learned, the more I knew I couldn't go back, but I was still afraid to go forward. And yet every single day through the way of the desert, that way of repetition and the way of th the word, he began to show me that that rest was in the promised land. And I had to get all the way through the desert to make it in. And I did, finally. The, that whole story is actually in the book. But in the meantime, I was learning to rest. And we think of peace, you know, as something that we have to beg for. But we, 
we hear it in the mass every single time we attend. My peace I leave you, my peace I give you. We already have it. The problem is we don't know how to guard it. So we have to learn how to guard our thoughts and go with him more deeply into our emotions and our memories and our judgments even so that we can also listen to the symptoms that our body is creating out of that fear because all of that is good self-knowledge and it's an area that God wants to heal. And the way we know that is because we keep encountering the same people in the same kinds of ways who hurt us in the same ways, the same sorts of deprivations over and over and over because that is the Holy Spirit's way of attempting to get our attention. And so if we can cooperate with him in our sufferings, St. John of the Cross said that none of our sufferings are arbitrary. They're all ordered to our particular woundedness. And my woundedness was a father wound that caused me to be rebellious. And I was learning to rest under a lack of authority, finally. But early on, it was terrible authority. And learning that, I'm still learning it. I think I'll probably be That'll be my swan song before I'm dying. I'll be still learning that lesson. But he's consistent. He, the, that way of repetition is how we follow him in our healing, in our thoughts and our emotions, our bodies and our souls. And he's leading us to that inner Sabbath. He's leading us to that final promised land, which Hebrews 4 talks about being ultimately heaven. But it's meant to start here. And that's why we encounter these deprivations. They're not punishment. They're not God being disappointed with us. He's, he's not trying to trap us, and he's not being mean to us. He's trying to help us learn how to rest fully in our thoughts and our emotions, our memories, our judgments, our bodies, our souls. Complete rest. That's the promise. So that's a quick little nutshell, but that's, that's the basic outline of the book anyway. All right. Well, we're talking with Sonia Corbett. You're listening to Beacon of Truth. I'm your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. And we're talking with my good friend, Sonia Corbett, about uh, her book, Just Rest, Inner Sabbath and Healing. And she just gave us a wonderful synopsis talking about uh, the template, basically, for the Christian life, uh, how we don't know God's ways. And then through three different ways that God brings us closer to him. One is that desert experience. Uh, challenging us in our deprivations because we have a tendency in deprivation to uh, to be sad, to be sullen, to not trust and let our kind of our emotions take over. She also talked about repetition, um, uh, moving in that repetition in the scriptures, how God moves us to a deeper level of trust. And then uh, through the word, uh, God calming our anxieties and fears and teaching us different ways to trust him. And, you know, Gosh, what I love about what you said, there's so many things. First of all, is how you, th this is a, a wonderful lesson, what Sonia is doing, how you take the scriptures and uh, how you look at the scriptures, not just as historical record, um, not just a legacy of how God has come to save us, but how our lives intertwine in God's word. So even though the, you know, we, we're, we're talking about books that were written almost 3,000 years ago, that God is still teaching us and uh, that word of God still applies to our everyday lived experience today. So by breaking open Hebrews and breaking open Exodus and the Psalms and, and the other books, Sonia is really teaching us how to get that uh, that peace. In, in, uh, uh, in the Gospels, Jesus talks about the peace that's beyond all understanding. You know, and as, and as Sonia was speaking, I, my mind was drawn to the uh, surrender novena, which is one of my favorite prayers to pray. Lord Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. And I was also uh, drawn to 1 John 4, 16. God is love. And he who lives in love lives in God and God lives in him. And a few verses later in verse 19, he says, perfect love casts out all fear. Casts out all fear. So we have to learn how. Yes. Yeah, we have to. Yeah, exactly. We have to learn how to love more than be afraid. So, uh, Sonia, just just really, really great stuff here. Um, and uh, so, so well, that's a good point too. One thing you also because so there are really only two emotions: fear and love. 
So if mm. we're if we're afraid, and that's natural, we're not really talking about like a a momentary fear of an actual danger. That's not what the Bible's talking about. Of course, we're going to be afraid of things that are dangerous. But what he's saying there is living in fear, living in anxiety. That is a that will shut down your whole immune system so that your body gets sick, right? And so if we're not living in love, then we can't grow. We can't develop the primary human need of every person developmentally, biologically is love. And if we're not getting that love on a daily basis from the scriptures, because surely everyone that, I, that can hear our voices has experienced the fact that the people around us can't love us as deeply as we need to be loved. There's a bottomless pit of love in, of, of need for love in me. And I can't feel it for myself and no one else around me can feel it. Only God can feel it. So if that's my primary need, where am I going to get that if I'm not at the one table of the Lord, the catechism says in 103, the one table of the Lord is the scriptures and the Eucharist. So we need both of those things. We have to have that, that daily diet of scripture to help us learn to love and to help us trust through our fear and to help us push through that, that unbelief that leads to unrest. So love is rest. And it comes through his word. It comes through the Eucharist, but it comes through his word, too. It's the one table. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, no, that that's awesome. Uh, we're talking with Sonia Corbett today on Beacon of Truth. I'm your host, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. We're talking about a great new book, Just Rest, Inner Sabbath and Healing. Um, and one of the things you say uh, in, in there, Sonia, is that there's a there's a, what you call a gentle tsunami of healing occurring in the church right now through the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. So talk to us about that. Well, that's a personal, that's not a churchism necessarily. Just in the one-on-one -on -one consultations that I've done with over 200 people now, the way I have them structured, I started after COVID, and the way I have them structured, I'm able to move through a, a really big thorough consult pretty quickly. And so I've, I've done a lot of them. And what I can see is there are miraculous healings happening right now in the church in our habits of thought, emotion, in our bodies and in our souls. It is a gentle tsunami. It's everywhere. And they where people with addictions and people with deep, deep emotional traumas and wounds I'm seeing and others, not just me, but others in coaching, in therapy, in counseling, in spiritual direction. Everyone is seeing and saying the same thing. It is a miraculous time. And we know from prophecy that our lady's immaculate heart will triumph and that there is to be a, a, an illumination of conscience. And I just believe that that's what we're living in. It's gentle, it's slow, but it's steady and it's miraculous. And so I think that she is guiding us in all of this healing. And I can say that from, from not just my relationship with her and, and with the Lord and with the scriptures, but just from, from my contact with other people who are doing and, and um, working in ministry the way I am and you are, we're, we're all sort of seeing the same things the healings that are happening and the victory that people are getting over their habits and their wounds and their addictions and all of that. It's just, it's miraculous. So it is a beautiful time, although it is dark in lots of places, the light is not only dawning, it is shining very brightly, very strongly and very powerfully and very gently. And so this is the work that we're supposed to do. This is the work of purgatory. And we're, we're not supposed to do it there. We need to be doing it now. We need to do it here where we have access to the sacraments and to medicine and all of the tools that can help us in this desert of learning how to love more deeply and more trustfully and more authentically. Most of us don't even know what that looks like because we didn't grow up with it. So we're having to learn it. And God knows that and he's patient. But I believe that we are living in the illumination of conscience. And I believe that Our Lady is facilitating it. And that is why we're seeing such miraculous victory in so many places, in our own lives and in the lives of those for whom we minister. Yeah, I, I would agree with you 100%. In fact, um, on this show, uh, when we, when we uh, have callers, you know, there's stories about 
how the Lord has come in, the Holy Spirit has come in, the relationship with the Blessed Mother has come in and really transformed their lives has been just awe-inspiring. So I, I, I totally agree yeah. with you. Well, Sonia, uh, thank you again for being with us on Beacon of Truth. It was so great to have you here. Where can people find out more about what you're doing and pick up Just Rest? Uh, you can find me on Google or any browser search under Sonia Corbett, S-O-N-J-A-C-O-R-B-I-T-T, -T, or BibleStudyEvangelista.com. All right. Well, you can always stream today's show by visiting Podcast Central at EW10.com slash radio and until we're together again my friends may almighty god bless you keep you and protect you the father and the son and the holy spirit amen <laughs>